we're starting this thing off. We're still, we're still learning this thing for Wednesday night, so T and I have been uh, just kind of going together and talking together. We're probably going to have more people up here at some point. We just hadn't had time to get down and get the plan together for that yet. But T started talking the other night about shift, and I need to go ahead and let everybody know we're taking up an offering. Where is Barry? He went to go get the bucket. I'm starting way too quick. I'm trying to learn to slow down. We'll see how that works for me. I'm learning to slow down and also try to change my words. Well, I don't know if y'all know this or not, but or notice this or not, but a lot of times when I, when I get to talking, I start this clutter mode. It's because I'm trying to say two things at once and neither one of them's coming out. Go ahead, Barry. <clears throat> so I don't know if I'll ever be able to get that right, but I'm going to try to get it to a better place than, uh, than what I've been before in the past. So I'm trying to slow down, especially when it comes to teaching because uh, it helps if I get it out and it's easier for you to understand if I haven't cluttered it all up. So T started talking about shift the other night. I haven't done prayer requests either. I'm going to have to have a form to go by to come up here. <laughs> I don't do pastoral stuff. I don't do, the, I don't do the form, the pomp, and the circumstance. I don't do that real well. Okay, there you go, T. You'll, I'm going to let you do prayer requests. Any prayer requests? Yes, ma'am. Remember your son's name? Darren. Anyone else? All right, since there's no one else. Father, we just thank you that we can come to you. And we know that your answers are yes and amen. Father, we just come as a church, as a unit, as a body together, bringing Darren before you. We ask for favor. His mother, his family are godly people. They love you. And Father, as a church, as a whole, we come and bring him before you and we ask for favor. Favor with you that he already has and favor with man. And that the, the responses and the answers that he will receive from, from whatever legal trouble that he's in will be that of you. That it will be smooth, that it will be a way that will be constructive and not destructive. And that, that, that will be an easy door and there will be an answers that will be only evident. That it will be irrefutable that it's you. And, Father, we feel safe that as we brought this before you, that, is, that the prayer is already answered. And we thank you for that, Father. Our confidence is in you. In Jesus' name, amen. Oh, T, we're going to have to get you fixed up. You're not supposed to be in front of people chewing gum. That's just not good. Uh, anyway, I'm just kidding. I love him like, I, like God loves him. I got the hairs of his head numbered. <clears throat> well, anyway, we, we, we've been talking about uh, shift, and uh, when, I, when I heard T talking about it, and I know other people uh, uh, heard Prophet Lisa talk about it and, uh, while she was here, but T was one of those that really just picked it up and carried it. So, I mean, he was really carrying that word, <clears throat> and um, so... He started talking about shift one night, and then I just came. I mean, I was just excited. I just went up and started talking to him. He wanted me to come up here the next Wednesday night, so we thought we'd do this. It's, uh, it's just a little bit difficult because we don't really have notes, and we don't know what the other person is going to say. So we're learning to do this, you know, again, because I haven't done anything. I haven't done this in a while, so. But anyway, so when we talk about shift, we discussed some things about how to shift last week. We're talking about shifting your mindset and sh uh, shifting your mind to the things that God is wanting to do because God's still wanting to do something in this earth. It may look like the church is losing ground. It may look like the, the, <clears throat> the liberals are winning and that, uh, <clears throat> that conservative Christianity is, is just a thing of the past. I even heard a man say one time that religion uh, as far as the uh, Christianity, it's, it's not even going to exist uh, like 50 years in the future. 
and and he and what he was saying was is the people don't people don't believe it anymore. But there's just one problem with that. God's got apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, and he'll always call somebody to preach. And see, the things that look like foolishness to them, God turns those things into the into the, the very things, the very ones that turn the world upside down. And so um, tonight we just want to talk about some, uh, some of the things. We're going to start off in, in um, Proverbs chapter 4. And I'm, I'm just going to read this verse, and then we're just going to, we're just going to pass it back and forth and get started because I'm, I, there are some things we need to talk about. First of all, when we talk about shift, there's a th- there are things that will hinder you from shifting into what God wants you to do and what God wants you to be. That's the reason why we always pray, God, help me see what I have not seen. Help me hear what I have not heard. Because if you're hearing the same thing and, and seeing the same thing that you've always, you're just going to keep doing, you're going to keep doing what you've always done. And that's religion. But God designed it so that there, was, there would be a preceding word, a word that came from God every day. It doesn't have to be a big word, but there's a word that God has for you every day. It may be behave yourself. <laughs> But it's a word, I mean, you know, and I can, I can show you from Scripture. So we're just going to get started in uh, Proverbs chapter 4 and verse 23. This is a familiar verse. Uh, preachers preach it, but I don't know of anybody that does it perfectly. I've never seen anybody do it perfectly. But we're going to talk about it. We're going to talk about some things that, uh, that, that hinder us. In verse 23, it says, Keep thy heart with all diligence. For out of it are the issues of life. Or guard your heart with all diligence. Now when he says guard your heart with all diligence. Guarding your heart with all diligence. All, that doesn't mean some. That means you don't take vacation. When it comes to your heart, you don't get to take a vacation. Because out of your heart, see out of your heart comes everything in your life. Everything in T's life comes out of his heart. It don't come out of my heart. What's in my life comes out of my heart. So he's got to guard what's in there. And if he doesn't guard what's in there, then guess what happens? There's going to be something that's going to get in there eventually because he didn't guard it and because there's a devil that wants to, to, to take him out because he's a a preacher and because he's a man of God and he'll try to put all types of things in there that will cause him to go in a direction that's not of God. Oh. <laughs> well, that's true. So we have to guard our heart with all diligence and how does things get in our heart? A lot of times, uh, I know Prophet Linda says prophecy, I won't refer to her. A lot of times, um, words get caught in our mind we keep focusing on different things and then a root of bitterness sometimes develop in our heart because we haven't kept our thoughts the way that we're supposed to so a way of guarding our heart or one of the one of the um uh, not a byproduct uh, but what's attached to um in our heart we have to develop what's in our mind make sure our mind is we're thinking the right things, we're doing the right things, we're focusing on the right things, we're meditating on the right things. Um, and then when we do that, then we can, that's, that is a way of guarding our heart, making sure nothing negative gets in our heart. And then also, sometimes we have to do some introspection of what's already in our heart. You know, we have a lot of things in our heart already that need to be developed. So you're not just protecting um, things that come in, but sometimes we're protecting and weeding out those things that need to get out of our heart as well. <clears throat> yeah, first, uh, first Corinthians. See, most uh, most of the time when people do things that aren't exactly right, uh, treat people in ways that aren't right, and we've all we've all we're all guilty of it. We don't like to admit it, but we're all guilty of it. We've all done things to people. We've had things done to us. But see, this is, this, is, this is where I began, where really God began to teach me some things. Because see, I've been, I've been in a place where there's just been absolutely religious people just abusing me. Okay? 
uh, people tried to break up my marriage, um, said all kind of horrible things about us. Stephanie got a dirty letter this week, um, you know, just, <laughs> you know. Uh, but see, here's the thing. You can't let that stuff get in there. You've got to fight that. Because what that's going to do is that's going to put you in front of somebody. See, in Mark 11, 23, 24, and 25, we know those, we know those verses because Kenneth Hagin gave them to us. And, you know, some people even call them Hagin 11, 23, and 24. But whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, be thou cast into thee, not doubt in his heart, believe the things he says, come to pass. He'll have whatever he says. So he talks the faith part, but then he gets down to the to the 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 twenty sixth verse when he talks about when you stand praying, forgive. See, see when you you have to forgive for your faith to work. And the reason you have to forgive for your faith to work is because there is nothing that messes with your belief system and what you believe like unforgiveness. It puts things in your heart that causes you, 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 your mind and your believing to then go in a wrong direction. And see, it doesn't matter the way you treat me. You don't have, you don't have to do anything. To, you don't have to come ask me to forgive you or anything like that. That's not what I'm after. What I'm after is you looking at your own heart and seeing where have I let these things in my heart to cause me to treat people in ways that they shouldn't be treated. Because when God began to turn this in me, see, I was looking, I was always looking at the things that people did to me. And they did some horrible things. But I was either going to live by that or I was going to get beyond that. And the way God got it across to me, he said, who have you done wrong? And see, I was going to go to 1 Corinthians, uh, but I'll just tell you what it says. And then we'll we'll go to um, we'll go to uh, Matthew the 18th chapter, and we'll look at this because I re I really didn't know exactly how we were going to go because I didn't want to uh, I wanted T to go with us and all this kind of stuff so I didn't know how to really do that. I'm learning to work together with T, so we're going it, it may seem a little uncomfortable at times, but we're but we're going somewhere. So. In, in, in 1 Corinthians, it, uh, Paul starts talking about the Lord's serpent, and, he, and he, talk, he starts talking about judging yourself. See, God gave you something. He gave you the ability. When you were born again, you have the ability in you to judge yourself. Now, if you were to walk into any courtroom in this land, there is no judge that's going to say, what do you think the judgment ought to be? They're not going to do that. They're going to they're going to they're going to look at what the law says, and then they're going to lay down the law. And that's pretty much the way it goes. But see, God doesn't do things that way, and that's where we've got to make a shift in our thinking, because see, these gifts the 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 church has got to rise up. It's not rising up. These mega churches aren't getting it done. But what we see are we see these these smaller churches where these apostles are, are, have been in the, waiting in the wings for a long time, and they're, they're coming along. But see, when it comes to the things that are in the earth, God's got everything this earth needs in the church, everything it needs. Every, every, for, uh, the solution for every crime, everything. It, we, the, we are the church, and God put us here as his governing body. Government can't fix this earth. They've already proved it. They prove it on a daily basis that they cannot fix anything. Their whole operation, the energy that, that drives them and motivates them is to get votes, to get elected or reelected, and that's, that's all they want. But see, in the church, we don't get voted in. We got a call, okay? So when we got that call, God, he... he <laughs> He doesn't repent of the call he put on your life. You got to do it. And even even when I was mad and offended, and and uh, you know, doing all my stuff, I still the call was still on my life. I still didn't get away from it. 
Uh, so, and I even had a, a, a prophet uh, prophesy. He said, "The gifts and the callings of doubt are without repentance, and no man will walk you out of it. No man will talk you out of it. You are. I am still holding you to that call." <laughs> and he didn't know what was going on with my life. So, see, it doesn't matter what it is. God's called you to do something. We're the body of Christ, and we're called to do something. We carry something on the inside of us. And that's why we preached uh, Christ in you, the hope of glory, because you have to develop that. You have to, you, that, that has to come forward. And it's just like last week we were talking about, you can tell what somebody is by what they carry. You know, Moses, he went up and when he came down, he had 10 commandments. He was carrying 10 commandments. That made him a lawgiver. You can look over here at Courtney. She's, she's got a big belly right now and she, she walks funny and she's carrying babies. That makes her a mother. Okay, so whatever somebody, when you can tell when somebody's carrying something, you know, something from God, but that's not the only things we carry because a lot of times we carry offense. A lot of times we carry unforgiveness. And see, here's the thing. Uh, uh, James talks about how no man can tame the tongue. You know why no man can tame the tongue? Because the tongue is simply a servant to what's already in your heart. It, this, thing doesn't, this thing doesn't go on its own and, and, and say anything. It just takes what's in my heart and puts it out here for everybody to see. If I'm mad at you, if I'm offended with you, it's going to, eventually it's going to talk about it, it's going to say it, it, and it'll be a fire of iniquity. And that's what uh, Hebrews talks about when it talks about a root of bitterness springing up and defiling many. See, if you don't deal with the unforgiveness that's in your own heart and in your own life, that is going to get down in there and you can, you can, if you don't deal with it, then you're, going, you're the one that's going to be sitting in front of people, hurting people and, 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 and doing things and, and uh, hurting people's lives. That was one, that was one thing I, I realized the last time we came back. The last time we came back, I was sitting here and I was so angry because of the things that had been done to me, the things that had been said. And there, I, I mean, one of the reasons we left is because I was just so angry, I was going to hurt somebody. I was going to hurt somebody because, because, see, this is what unforgiveness does. It turned me into the very thing that I hated the most. The thing that I fought against the most, I got into unforgiveness, and that unforgiveness turned me into the very thing I hated the most, and I hurt people. And that's what happens when you get into unforgiveness and offense. You start hurting people, people, people that you don't even mean to hurt. They get caught in the crossfire. And there were people that, uh, that got hurt because of the things that I did. I didn't mean to do it. I wasn't trying to do it. But there was just, there was just some things that, uh, you know, I, 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 jumped, I jumped a lot of people. Just how dare you? You know, I, I, Anessa got caught, got caught the fallout on one of them, you know. Uh, that's a whole different thing because there was somebody else, uh, do, but that's a whole different lesson in, as far as religious people and dealing with religious people uh, because there are some people in your life, you have to take a look at your life. And if there's somebody constantly, constantly, constantly berating you and, and hurting you, that's called abuse. Abuse. And if, and if you let that uh, continue and occur, they won't even be around anymore. And you'll still be feeling that abuse. You'll go home with it. You'll be eating dinner with it. They, they can die and go to heaven. And you're still living with that abuse. Now you've become a self-abuser. Because you're abusing your own self. That's the reason why you know, people, they, uh, they're more harder on themselves than any, because, because of that abuse. Because they, there's a wrong expectation placed on them. So we just want to look at uh, some of these things tonight in, in Matthew, uh, starting in chapter 18. This is one of those things, see, because T and I, we get into this all the time. Which one of us is the greatest? I mean, you know, T's just like, Andy, I'm so much better than you. And I'm like, no, I can sing better than you. <laughs> <laughs> We're not going to sing that song because, I, I, first of all, I can't sing. But anyway, but you know what? And I and I can tell you this: you want to know one of the, the 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 easiest ways to get religious people mad? I love to do this. I know I shouldn't do it, but I love to do this. Just tell them you're more spiritual than they are. <laughs> they go off the chain, man. They, 
I mean, they break loose. They just, who do you think you are? I'm the one that just got your goats. Well, I... <laughs> and they don't want anybody else to think that they can be spiritual. And God didn't call us to be that way. And so, uh, I, you know, I have to tell T all the time, T, I'm just better than you are, man. It's not my fault I was born that way. <laughs> no, we don't talk about each other like that. But here in, in this 18th verse, now, uh, the seventh in the, uh, or the 18th chapter, the 17th chapter, you know, Jesus was on the mountain and they came down and uh, they've talked about this, uh, all this, uh, this, is, this is where we get the uh, fasting, uh, uh, it, it, it deals with your unbelief. But you get down to the um, 18th chapter and it says, at the same time came the disciples unto Jesus saying, now, here's the question that, that, that they asked him. Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Now, this is the reason why T thinks that he's the greatest, because he acts like a little child sometimes. <laughs> it says, verse 2, And Jesus called a little child into, uh, unto them, and set him in the midst of them, and said, Verily I say unto you, except you be converted, and become as little children, you'll not enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, of course, we understand what he's talking about. We know that, that he's talking about well, you're going to have to be born again. But there's something he's teaching. Now, they asked a question. They've asked a question, and he doesn't stop. He goes on, and he lays this thing out all the way up into the next chapter. So, uh, as I was going through this, I, you know, I, I wanted... I, I really wanted to people for, for people to understand because unforgiveness is sneaky. And, and, and unforgiveness, when unforgiveness gets to you, you can tell. I mean, if, first of all, it happened to me uh, a couple of weeks ago. And I realized I was walking around with attitude. And I don't like having an attitude because, first of all, I don't know how you are, but when I get a bad attitude, especially about somebody, I'm walking around, and I'm, I'm, my emotions are high one minute, and I, the, these chemicals are being released, and I'm just, and then the next minute, I'm just like, oh, I got no energy. And I just don't like riding that roller coaster. I don't like it. It makes me feel bad, and I just don't like to feel bad. So that's one, one, good, one good reason to not get in unforgiveness. So he goes on here, and he, he, he lays this thing out, line upon line, precept upon precept. And, you know, there was, a, there was a time and a season that people came back and they began to talk about offense. People have written books and uh, all these kinds of things, and so people just think that they got it. If they, can, if they get up and they preach it, then, hey, man, I'm good, I got it. But that ain't got nothing to do with it. It's a daily, daily, daily thing because there's always, always somebody in your life that can offend you. you know, I, don't have to, I don't have to give you examples because y'all got enough in your own life. So, he goes, uh, he goes in the fourth verse, Whosoever, therefore, shall humble himself as this little child, the same is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Now, we can talk about humility, and we can talk about all these different things, or we can go, we can go ahead and read on and let Jesus tell us what he means by it. It says, Whosoever shall receive one such little child in my name receiveth me. Now, you understand He's talking about, he's talking about one, once we're born again and become as a little child. But whosoever shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and that he were drowned in the depth of the sea. Now, that's pretty, that's pretty tough <laughs> because I've offended people. I've, I've offended little ones. But Jesus is trying to, 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 to get not, not just, he's not going to just tell us not to do this. He's going he's to lay out how to get out of this mess. Because, see, when I came back, uh, there were some people that were uh, mad at the decision Dad made uh, to put me and Stephanie in the positions that he put us in because he just put us in right away. And there were people saying, well, he needs to prove himself and all this kind of stuff. And the, and the question they should have been asking is, my God, man, how did you get out of that offense? Because there was, I mean, at one, you, you were offended, you were mad, you were angry, you were dangerous at one point. So how did you get out of it? 
but they don't, and they don't realize that they're even caught up in it. He said, verse 7, Woe unto the world because of offenses. For it, it must needs be that offenses come. But woe to that man by whom the offenses come. Wherefore, if thy hand or thy foot offend thee, cut them off and cast them from thee. It is better for thee to enter into life, halt or maimed, rather than having two hands and two feet, and to be cast into everlasting fire. And if thy eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee. It is better for thee to enter into life with one eye, rather than having two eyes and be cast into hellfire. Take heed that ye despise not one of these little ones. Okay, so what he's doing here is he's trying to tell you, there are, if, if you're going to guard your heart, you're going to keep your heart with all diligence, you're going to have to do some pretty drastic things to keep those things out. And when we talk about, and I think maybe we might have got this phrase, because I use the phrase a lot, just going into God, but when I say going into God, what I'm talking about, I'm talking about meditating the Word. I'm talking about fasting. I'm talking about praying in tongues. See, God didn't make it hard. And in, in uh, Romans, the 12th chapter, when he said, when he said uh, be renewed, uh, uh, the, that you may prove that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God, those are all three different phases of the will of God that you're supposed to prove in your life. One's not better than the other. It's just a different phase. You start out with the good will of God. You move to the acceptable will of God, and then you, move, then you go into the, the perfect will of God. And the picture of that is Abraham's rod that budded. If you remember, when, when the children of Israel were in the wilderness, they were upset with Moses. They didn't think he should be leading. They just, they didn't think Apostle David was smart enough. I mean, Moses was smart enough. They thought that they knew more than he did. They thought they were more gifted than he was. And so God said, look, I'll tell you what. Take, take, take from every one of the elders, every one of the leaders, take a rod and put them out. And the one that buds, that's the one that's going to lead. Well, Aaron's rod was the one that budded. And that was, the, that, that was the leadership that God had put in place. And it wasn't just that it budded. It, 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 it leafed, it budded, and it produced an almond. Good, acceptable, and perfect. And we'll see, this, here's the thing. That rod that budded was in the Holy of Holies. It was in the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant, uh, the Holies of Holies, is not... Uh, heaven. That's not a type of heaven. That's a type of your born again spirit. There were three things, three things in the Ark of the Covenant. One was Abraham's, uh, uh, Aaron's rod that budded. That was good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. That comes out of your spirit. You're, be, you're to be transformed by the renewing of your mind and so that you'll prove good, acceptable, and perfect. The other one was a, a, a thing of manna that fell in the wilderness, that fell daily. Let give us this day our daily bread. So every day, every day you have a relationship with God. If you have, if you have a need for anything, then that word is there for you. God is always there for you. The other one was the Ten Commandments, which is a type and a shadow of basically the love that was shed abroad in your heart by the Holy Ghost. You are living, breathing arcs of the covenant walking around on this planet. You are the holy of holies. You are the, see, that was the, the mercy seat where you went to obtain mercy, where you went to obtain help. That's where the Holy Ghost was. Where is the Holy Ghost living? In us. He's sitting on that seat of your heart. And that's where you go to find grace, to help in a time of need. And it's always, always, always available. And he will not leave you. He will not forsake you. He will help you. He will bring you out of everything, and he will teach you how to fulfill your call. Because, see, the Abraham, uh, Aaron's rod that budded had to do with leadership. And what God was saying is, is leadership comes from your born-again spirit. Leadership comes out of your spirit. It doesn't come 
from, I'm talking about for your life. For your life, nobody has to come and tell you what to do. Nobody has to go to the priest anymore. The Bible says that you don't have to go here or there. Every one of you are going to know me from the least to the greatest. And so when he's, talk, when, he, uh, when he's talking about this right here, he's talking about that day that you become born again and you're able to become that judge because that you judge everything by that love of God that's been shed abroad in your heart by the Holy Ghost. So that love knows when you're out of love. And that becomes your judge. The problem is, is when people get religious, they don't want to look at themselves. You know what the hardest part about transformation is? Dealing with this. Looking at yourself. And in, in 1 John, when he says, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, he's the propitiation for our sins. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us. See, he forgives us and cleanses us. But see, what people don't realize is it's a process. When, when the children of Israel, when God looked at uh, uh, Joshua and said, be strong and of a good courage because you're about to go into your soul. <laughs> and that's what he was doing. That is the picture of the born again man and woman leaving spiritual death, being born again, and going into his own soul to conquer what's in there. And you have to have the Holy Ghost with you. God said he'd be with him. He said, don't, don't, don't be afraid, don't be dismayed. He said, meditate in my word. E.W. Kenyon said that meditation in the Word of God is like a visit with Jesus because, because the Holy Ghost is here to illuminate this Word, to make it real to us, to put it in our hearts, and not just put it in our hearts, to, but to build an edifice in our heart because what God wants to do is to make us like Jesus, that is, a Word made flesh, dwelling in this earth, dwelling in this time, in this season. See, the, uh, the news media talks about all these problems uh, with, with inner city violence. I think Chicago, um, Stephanie told me that Chicago's had like 600, 600 uh, murders. That is, that is just, that's out there, man. That's more than the population of Carnesville. That's more than the population of the city we're sitting in right now. 600 people. But see, God's got somebody that hasn't answered the call because there's somebody that is the word that is a word made flesh that's dwelling among them and they've not answered the call. That's how he's going to get done. People sitting up in these mega churches and teaching leadership lessons on how to get rich and how to, how to live a happy life and all this kind of stuff. Somebody, sometimes serving God's not happy, folks. Because you're not here to be happy. You're here to do something. That's, if you don't fight for the kingdom, your children will have no kingdom to live in. Because you're not, you're not just citizens of the kingdom, you're warriors of the kingdom. So you have to pray. You have to, you have to believe God. We're an apostolic church. We're not, we're, we're not, a, we're not a, a pastoral church. Not the pastoral model that's been given to us. A past, uh, that pastoral model isn't right. That's just people hoarding people together and coming together and feeling good. But when you leave, what's your assignment? What are you going out there to do? How are you changing your territory? How are you changing your culture? How are you changing your environment? Most of us are, are, are so mad because we think somebody owes us something, which is basically what unforgiveness is. Unforgiveness is when you think somebody owes you something. See, I'm going to mess this whole thing up because I was going to try to go down, down here line by line, precept upon precept. And I didn't got, I, didn't, I mean, I just, I just, I didn't mess it up. See, Jesus goes in here and he tells you, he tells you, first of all, it's impossible. It is impossible, but that offenses will come. So you're going to get, the, I mean, it won't just happen today. It'll happen tomorrow. It'll happen the next day. But see, if you, if you let that, if you let that happen, it's not, it's not that you're just, becoming something that you shouldn't be. The devil is using that to, tr to stop the call of God in your life. Your assignment, what God has assigned for you. 
And so far, the church is failing miserably in this area because you can, all you got to do is look at the world and see somebody's not doing something. Somebody's not doing something right. I mean, when you've got 600 murders in Chicago and you've got people doing all kind of crazy stuff, you know, and I mean, and it sounds good. It sounds good that, that somebody did something to me and by God, it's right that you have to pay. But see, that's an old covenant. That's Old Testament. Eye for an eye, tooth for tooth. They didn't have the ability to forgive. They, had, they, they didn't have it. Not truly. They, had no, they, they couldn't do it. That's, that's a spiritually dead man. That's his, that's his, uh, that's, he, if you do something to me, then I'm going to do something to you. And actually, the eye for an eye thing, basically what that means is, uh, I think Billy Brim was telling Dad about it. Dad told me about it. But what that means is it's, it's not that if you put my eye out, uh, then I put your eye out. That's not what it means. But what it means is if, if you do an accident that causes me uh, to lose one of my eyes, then you have to give fair compensation for what you've done. And see, that was under the law. But under the new, uh, under the new covenant, when you were born again, you become the, the beneficiary. See, the, 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 the testator has died, and we have inherited so we already have, we're already trying to get, we're already trying to get what we already have. It's already, it's already been given to us. The problem is that we have a devil that's trying to indoctrinate us and tell us things that don't work. And see, you spend your energy. You know, we talked about that a, a, a few weeks ago with, uh, about the apostolic energy and the energy that people carry. There's an energy that people carry, and, and what, what happens is, is the devil comes in and tries to get you offended and get you angry. You ever notice you can't just be angry and be still? You, I mean, now T can. T can, T can. T can just get mad and just, and I just, I can't tell he's angry. He just walk around. Like he's, you know. Me, I'm just, my nerves, my nerves have done, I'm, I mean, I'm like I've done drunk too much coffee. And then that only lasts for a little while, and all my energy's gone. So see, now I'm drained, and that's why people don't fulfill the call of God for their life. Because they've spent their energy that God gave them doing things, and they never finish. They, they burn their energy up chasing things that, that they're not supposed to be chasing. Your body... Was, was, is made to do certain things, and you have to, you have to guard your heart because that, uh, your, your, your brain just produces chemicals, and those chemicals will cause your body to produce things that it shouldn't be producing at times it shouldn't be producing. That's how people get sick. They get cancer. They get all these things, and then when it comes time to get healed, they don't have faith to get healed because they're in unforgiveness, and it's messed with their belief system. And they don't have faith for it. They can't believe God for it. They don't even understand where it's coming from. They don't understand why they don't have faith. They don't understand why none of these things are working for them. All they know is they died. And, they, then, and nobody even knows. They don't, they, nobody knows who took them out, how it happened. But they were indoctrinated over a period of time. Why? Why? Because they did not judge themselves they did not look at themselves see you have to look at yourself every day and ask God to forgive you of your sins of your sin whatever sin is the act of doing something or not doing something but then he doesn't just do he doesn't just forgive you of that he's faithful and just to cleanse you from the unrighteousness. Unrighteousness is the, uh, is the wrong believing that caused the sin in the first place. And see, the Bible, when the Bible talks about the deceitful lusts and all these kinds of things, people just automatically take sin to sex. And they miss, the, they, they miss what's really being said there. Because you have to go into, you have to go into your own soul, just like Joshua did, meditating day and night with courage, with the Holy Ghost, and deal with that thing. 
And if you remember, they didn't kill everything. There were some things they saved because they were, it, it was useful for, for the purpose of what God wanted to do. But if you, if you also remember, there, remember Jesus talked about the two kings and what, and, and what king going to war against another king sets, doesn't sit down first and think, do I have enough to do this? If you go back to the Old Testament, when Joshua went into the land, there were, there were uh, a number of kings that came to them Got all this moldy bread, all these, these, these old wine skins and all these things and came to them and said, oh, we've come from, from afar, we've come a long journey. And they made a covenant with them. And that's what, your, that's what your flesh will do. It'll try to covenant with your spirit and say, look, if you don't, I, I'll behave if you just don't. I won't, I won't fight for control in this area if you'll just, if you'll just let me. I, it's not that bad. I mean, come on, man. You know, but it is that bad. As a matter of fact, this is the this is the uh, this is the New Living Translation. Now, T, you need to jump in here at any time, man. Okay, okay. Well, um, just to piggyback on what Pastor was saying is that. Um, just like Joshua went in to destroying those kings wanting to make covenant. And a lot of times our body and, our, and our old thoughts don't want to die. We want to make covenant with us. We want us to compromise. But if we notice, um, the reason why Joshua lost victories was because they took things and buried them. And sometimes in our life, the reason why we lose is because we take things that need to die and that need to be destroyed, but we bury it. You could have talked a little bit longer, too. Okay. This is the, uh, the what did I say, translation it was? Anyway. Uh, Psalms 107, verse 34 says, you don't have to turn there, I'll read it. It says, Israel failed to destroy the nations in the land as the Lord had commanded them. Instead, they mingled among the pagans and adopted their evil customs and they worship their idols, which led to their downfall. And that's exactly what happens to us on an individual basis, and therefore it happens to the church. There is an indoctrination in this country. See, the reason, the reason that God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, when I was working at this particular place, I remember this, there was this older guy, he was a Catholic, and he said, uh, he said he was not against any kind of homosexual or anything like that, homosexuality or anything like that. He said, he said, um, he said it's unnatural. He said, but it's not contagious. And now he's not the only one I've heard say that. So, so there, there's this thing that says it's not contagious. Well, first of all, you have to understand, sex is the most addictive thing that there is. So it actually is contagious. There are, there are several ways that you can become a homosexual. One can be through sexual abuse. Uh, one can be through being a whoremonger where you're just, you're out there. First it's, it's, uh, you know, first it's with one partner. Uh, then it's with two partners of the opposite sex. And then that's not enough anymore. So then you, you're looking for more partners and that's not enough anymore. So you go to same sex. That's another way to become homosexual or bisexual or all these, all these kinds of things. And people think that, that it's okay. That it's an alternate lifestyle. It, it, it's okay. It's an alternate lifestyle. And it's, and it's an indoctrination. And the reason that God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah is because it, it, it was so addictive. He had to because he was trying to get Jesus in the earth. And if he hadn't, if he hadn't done it, he wasn't, just looking, he wasn't just looking for people to destroy. He didn't destroy every city. He destroyed them because that sin, when you walk into a city, has anybody ever walked into a city and somebody just see you? And they start knocking on your door because they want to have sex with you. That's pretty, that's pretty brazen. That's pretty bold. That's the kind of thing that was going on. That's how far these people had gotten. Yes, it's, it, yeah, it's wickedness. And that's basically the things that, are, that the devil's trying to do now. He's trying to get it. He's trying to indoctrinate. It's okay to experiment. 
and through these universities. and th It's okay to experiment and go ahead and try it. Because, see, once you try something, as long as you're open to it, it will, it will, it will start creating an appetite. Sex is the, most dim, is the most addictive thing there is. So, I'm sorry. It, it doesn't matter if, if you don't like it, but it's true. And so that's one thing that the church, and we have to do, we have to do it with wisdom. Because we haven't in the past. Because, because beating people up is not giving them an attitude adjustment. Hitting them, hitting them is not giving people an attitude adjustment. That's not the adjustment. Now, you may, I mean, if, I don't know if you've ever seen uh, Caesar Malone, but he, he's, he's a dog trainer or whatever. And when it, when it comes to that dog, he just, he'll, he'll hit it in the butt with his foot and go, Tsk. what's he doing? He's slapping it right across the face. He's, he's not, that's to get his attention, just to get his attention. Because now i got something, you, you stay focused. See, that's the thing. We're, we're getting, we're, we're not staying focused. And the devil is, is the world's best. He's the one that came up with it. At getting us distracted with things that don't matter and getting our, getting our, our words and all of our terminology from media. And living a life that's, hey, it's okay. homosexuality is okay, it's all right. Now, look, if you're going to run into people, I have people that in my, in my uh, family on my side and on my family in, on, on Steph's side that are in that lifestyle. Do I hate them? No, but I want them to get out because that lifestyle is not good. It's not, it's not conducive it's for, for, their, for, for their, what God's got for them. So... I mean, you know, I can feel it. It's all right. I'm gonna let I'm gonna let T talk about racism. You notice you notice everybody talks about talking about racism, but nobody talks about it. And look, I'm just gonna be honest with you. I don't care if you don't like NASCAR, but just because you don't like NASCAR, don't mean you don't like the people that race. You don't have to be a racist. <laughs> No, we'll talk about it when we know more about it. But I can tell you this, see, the news media, <laughs> I, know, I know you're still trying to process that, ain't you? You, you? Yeah. Yeah, it takes a while. Sometimes I say something deep every now and then. <clears throat> It'll take you a while to get out of it. <laughs> yeah, you have a question? What's that? Well, you have to follow God. You, I mean, it, I, you know, having having a having a partner that is on fire for God is a great benefit. But not having one is not an excuse. I mean, and that's just that's just the way of it. Um, now, all situations are different, and and those kinds of things. But you know, we are the church. We are the church. We are the church. And see, I say that, and people don't even get it when I, when I say we're the church because they're still thinking this church building. They're still thinking Sunday morning, Sunday night, or Wednesday night, or all this kind of stuff. And see, our mind has got to shift to the place that we are the church. We're not, we're representatives of the kingdom, and we have to press. If, if you don't have miracles and gifts of the Spirit in your life, then you need to find out, well, Lord, why don't I have miracles and gifts of the Spirit in my life? They're not just for fivefold. They're for you as well. The, well, some of you are fivefold. You just don't know it yet. But, uh, you know, those, the gifts of the Spirit were given to you to empower your assignment from God. They were given so that you would have the power you needed when somebody stepped in front of you and God wanted to be a witness 
you would have the wisdom, the word of wisdom, the word of knowledge, the discerning of spirits. If there was somebody that needed to be healed, the gift of faith, workings of miracles, gifts of healing. If there's something that needs to be said, they gave you tongues, interpretation of tongues. He gave you, and, and then he gave you prophecy. And Paul said, we can all prophesy. But we've got to get past this place that in our minds, we think, we think that Apostle David is an apostle. No, we've got to get apostolic in our heart. Because if Apostle David passed away, who would carry, who would carry apostolic? And I can tell you this, there's a lot of people that started out in the apostolic move. They don't even call themselves apostle anymore. They, it's either bishop or, um, or it's either bishop or pastor. But, and the reason they quit is because of indoctrination. There's a real devil that's trying to stop the apostolic church. And I remember this. I remember the people talking about uh, uh, they were writing books, and that's all they were after. That's all they wanted to do. They saw this move of God coming, and they just wanted to write books and, and get their stuff. They wanted, to, they wanted to take advantage of the move of God and get their book out there so they could get, they wanted to fleece the sheep. And so they, they were making statements like, um, you know, the apostolic is going to be the shortest move of God. Then we're going to move into the believer's move. You don't get to the believer's move until you get the foundation in place. The church is supposed to be set on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. And it's about time that the apostles and prophets started talking about the foundation, which is the, 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 the apostles and prophets. Until, until, see, these mega churches with pastor so-and-so and, -so and brother so-and-so and bishop so-and-so and, -so and all these, they're not the church because they got no foundation. And so the, the, the foundation has to be there for the believers to be, to be matured, to be developed, to be all of these things. So, we got a church, we've got a church, or what we call church, that they're not doing anything. You think it bothers Mr. Mega Church that there were 600 100, uh, murders in Chicago? I done left. We done, we done left a thing here. We just might as well keep going. And T's, T's done, I mean, he's done, I mean, I, you done left it to me now. 600, 600 murders, man, 600 murders, and nobody cares. It doesn't even, I mean, and here's the thing. We live in America. We live in a free society. That's not a privilege. That's a responsibility. We're sitting around wanting people to do stuff for us, and God's saying, man, get up and do something for somebody else. When me and Stephanie came up here, man, I don't make big bucks. I get paid. I, get, I make like $105 a week. That's what I get paid, but I got a new truck. I got a place to live. God has provided for me. See, he, we, uh, Proverbs says that he will cause us to inherit substance. You don't need money if you have substance. If you have God, what do you need money for? He will provide himself every time. He's in, every time God calls somebody to do something, any time he sent them out, he, would, he never sent them out by himself. He always provided himself. He always stood with them. He always, when, the, when, the, when, the, when uh, Shadmach, Shadrach, Meshach, and that bad Negro got in that pit, <laughs> there was a fourth man in the fire with them. And he saved them. He, they didn't go by themselves. <laughs> what? <laughs> I'm just saying. I just I know this. I know this. If when 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 the when the fists start flying, I want that man on one side. I want that woman right there on this side, because I want somebody to fight with me. When Daniel went to the lions, did God went with him? When you go to that school, you have to realize God goes with you. When you go to work, God goes with you. He will provide himself. Now, you can't go out there and do anything crazy. That ain't what I'm saying. But you walk, you be as wise as a serpent, harmless as a dove. You learn to walk with God. You learn to, when I, when I worked at uh, Carolina Closet, 
When I first got there, there was nobody there other than the owner. There was nobody there that was saved or filled with the Holy Ghost. When I left, there wasn't anybody that wasn't saved and filled with the Holy Ghost. And God showed up miraculously. And he didn't just do it through me. There was one man. He ran the, he ran the saw. His name was Richard. He's passed on. Uh, he's in heaven now. But he, I mean, I just thought, man, he's just a hard case. I'll, I mean, I'm just never going to get him. But Mac Williams, Mac Williams was uh, listening to me uh, on uh, Wednesday night talking about speaking in tongues. Go in the car. He had a cassette. It was a cassette back then. And uh, Mac Williams got filled with the Holy Ghost in the car riding down the road. And after I left, I talked to Mac Williams one time, and Mac Williams, after that guy had uh, went downhill, Mac Williams went and got him saved. So sometimes it's not the one. It, you, don't, you never know what you're doing. You, you don't know what you're, you're bringing uh, into manifestation. The, the thing is, is just to get Christ manifesting in you. You've got to get Christ in you to manifest. And we teach that around here. That's the reason why it's important. I don't know of any other churches that preach it like that. Because there are certain things, fasting deals with, with fasting deals with your flesh. It makes you uncomfortable, yes, but it deals with your flesh. Praying in tongues builds up your spirit, man, teaches you. Where do you think I learned this stuff at? I'm not smart. I'll, the Holy Ghost teaches me. And see, and see, here's the thing. People will fast before they'll pray in tongues. I've watched it for years. And see, uh, so because some of these people that have come in and left and just went and said awful horrible, terrible things, they, would, they, would come, they came in and they fasted, but they wouldn't pray in tongues. They didn't believe that and for edification, tongues for edification. They didn't believe in it. Well, see, if you, if you get a Baptist to fast, he just becomes a better Baptist. That's what the Bible talks about when he's talking about uh, uh, cleansing yourself of filthiness of spirit. He's talking about wrong believing. They, there are things in you that, they, that just don't, uh, are, are not from God and you got to get that stuff out. So you have to have a teacher, a guide to help you to get into that. It's not just, it's not just the things that, that, that you were not taught about God. A lot of times the things you were taught about God's wrong. And so when you step in front of somebody, you've got all this unbelief you've got to deal with. Because you don't believe God can use you. And we deal with that. that that's another mind uh, shift that's got to take place. Because people have looked around. There are people doing things in this church right now that, that would have never gotten an uh, opportunity to do it. If those people hadn't left. And God moved them out of the way because they could not see. They couldn't see what was in other people. The church, the church that God wants, his bride, is a different animal than what we even see today. And if we want, if we want to move into what God wants for us, then we're going to have to go into our own soul. We're going to have to deal with unforgiveness. We're going to have to deal with our pride. See, fasting helps you not hide from your own flesh, those things in you that you don't want to deal with. Do you think it's easy for me to, 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 to uh, I mean, I, I was holding on to my unforgiveness. Oh, man. Because I had evidence. I could, I could have took them to, the court, to a court of law, and I could have, I mean, I could have won. And, and uh, probably, uh, defamation of character, I probably could have won some money and got some money because of the things they said. But what's that money going to do for me when I get before Jesus? And when, when 1 Corinthians says, judge yourselves that you be not judged, I get to judge it now. I got to look at my own heart, not yours. I don't look at your heart. I'm, I, I'm not called to look at your heart. You're called to look at your heart. You're the one that has to do that. But I can tell you this, once you do it, once you do it, all of a sudden things are going to change. You're, you're, you're sitting here in unforgiveness one day, because it happened to me. I'm sitting here in unforgiveness one day, man, I'm mad and offended. And then I wake up another day, and I'm just like, I've got all this, all, there's all, just all this peace, and there's revelation that starts flowing. and You know, I mean, just all this stuff, and now I understand the Bible. Like, I mean, now all I want to do is get in the Bible, because just, ugh. Uh, there's so much because I, 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 there, there's so much I want to study out and, and get it out. I mean, I, I, the seven spirits of God. I want I want to study that out. There, you know, um, 
Genesis, all of these things. Well, what happened? There's a part of, of my heart that was being occupied with all this energy, with all this, all this unforgiveness, this part that just was, wasn't, it wasn't God. And when, that, when I got rid of it, when I got rid of it, it was gone. Then there was all this, this openness. And all of a sudden, God starts putting things in there. And I'm sitting down there, and I never did say, I mean, I've just, I, I mean, you know, uh, God supernaturally hooked me back up with Dad, and Dad said to me one day, y'all need to get your butts back up here. And that's what happened. But it didn't happen until I got out of the unforgiveness. But see, that's not, I can't stop there. I can't allow because the devil still try to bring it in. And see, we're the, we're, we're the church. And we've got to press. We've got to press for our call. We've got to press for it because we've got indoctrination that comes in and tries to tell us all kinds of things through the news media, all these different things. Trying to trying to trying to to walk us out of what God wants us to do, what God wants us to be. That's what it's all about. That's what the church is all about. That's what apostolic energy is all about. It's about moving us. See, God doesn't just give you the gifts. There's, there's something in, in God called energy. Most of the time in the New Testament, when you when you hear Paul talk about a working, a work, a worketh, that's the, the, the Greek word is energy john or something like that anyway there's just a tense that's different but it's an energy and see when when that's in your heart and, and there's something in there then there's an energy that begins to move me into business if god's called me into business then there's the energy i get all this other stuff out of the way you'd be surprised at what happens when you get everything out of the way then all of a sudden all my thoughts begin to move me toward business or my thoughts begin to move me toward teaching or my thoughts begin to uh, to move me toward uh, uh, building a school or, uh, or, or uh, all kinds of things. That's another, that's another thing. See, there, there's words that have been spoken over this church, and those words hold and contain that energy, the energy of God. It's just we haven't, we, haven't had, we haven't been in the place to receive it, to believe it, because there's been things that the, de I mean, the devil's been fighting. You understand that, right? That's the reason why you've had to go through the things that you've gone through. That's the reason why you've had to deal with the things you've had to deal with. There's been a real fight. But now God is saying, now it's time to let those things go and it's time to move on. It's time to shift out of what I did yesterday because I've got something to do today and I want to move you into it. And you're going to have to let go of that because I've got something to move you into. And it ain't like what it was yesterday. Cause, 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 because what they were doing yesterday has, has not produced anything. That, that, that beginning of that apostolic uh, move that everybody was writing books uh, a lot of them are dead, and they're not even calling themselves apostles anymore. They're, and some of them are even out of the ministry. Why? Because when, the, because when the indoctrination came and the deceiver came and all of these things came and the, and the persecution came, they could not stand. But at least, I know Dad's got his faults. I lived with him for many years. But at least he stood his ground. Jonas Clark, I hadn't dealt with him a whole lot, but he's still an apostle. At least he stood his ground. He's had battles to fight. He's had things to, to face, but at least he stood his ground. Apostle Terrell Murphy walked away from, a, from Mega. Walked away from Mega. I don't know about you, but when somebody does something like that, and, and he's still apostle. The, one of the most powerful services, I, if not the most powerful service, I can't think of one, was when he came in here. And, I mean, he was breaking things in the spirit that night. I don't know about you, but those, those are three apostles that I want to be hooked up with. Because they have an apostolic energy, and the only way you get apostolic energy is if there's got to be an apostle in the mix somewhere. But it's not just that. We went over to, uh, to Mr. Harold's before he passed, and we were sitting there praying, and I realized there's more out there. There's more people that we, have, that, that we should be having a relationship with. God's raising them up. They've not bowed their knee to Baal. They've not bowed their knee. They're out there. They're just like us. They're sitting in a small community, or maybe they're in a big, a, a big community, but they're out there, and they're fighting against Jezebel. They're fighting against, you know, Python. All these, whatever your favorite name for the devil is. <laughs> Just pick one. And they're fighting against it because these religious spirits are trying to stop the church 
from rising up and becoming. He's trying to stop you. He's trying to indoctrinate you to accept that it's just okay to be gay. It's not okay to be gay. It's not okay. And I'm not talking about abusing people. Now, you don't, 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 don't say that. Uh, that's just the biggest one that we're, that, that, uh, it's in the country right now. And so that's the one I use the most. Uh, the other one is these, these self-interest groups, these self-interest groups that come along, and they're just trying to get their stuff. They're just trying to, I was done this way, so I want you to pay me for what was, you know. And you got a bunch of them. Okay, T, here you go. Okay, well, I'll jump in at the last one. That was, a, I mean, that's, that's good. I mean, that's, that's totally where we're at because we're shifting. And part, of the, and part of the apostolic shift is, first thing we have to do, we have to deal with the offenses. Because if we're ever going to move forward, like you said, Pastor, is that things, people will say words and people will, uh, things will come to you that deal with your heart. Why you, first of all, why are you going to this assembly, why are you going to this church, or, or why are you going to picking that job, or why are you behaving this way? Why are you, so we have to deal with offenses. We have to deal with that. As far as, and after we deal with offenses, like you said before, we have to deal with our thinking. And you talked about it in, in Matthew, how we have to deal with our thinking. We, it, it's going to take a shift in our thinking as far as when, we talked, when you talked about Joshua, you know, they came in, had to fight the battles. A lot of times when they, when they hit the things, they failed. They failed. They, they lost the war. In order to, in order to, in order to, be, to really shift, you're going to have to uncover those things and deal with those things. And it will be painful, just like you said. If, your eye think, um, if you um, cut off your hand, if your leg offends you from moving forward, cut, up, cut, cut your leg off, cut your eye off. It says it in Matthew. It's going to be painful shifting. You know, so don't think that when you're changing your mindset that it's not going to be painful because your mindset deals with your emotions, all right? And, and, and when we get all in a fist, like you talked about, we get all mad and stuff, it provides an energy for us to, to respond a certain way. Well, it, it takes time to change how you respond to things. It takes time to do that. So all of those things we're going to have to shift, we're going to have to shift in. It takes, it takes, it takes a shift in mentality to say, hey, um, Living a, a, uh, living a homosexual lifestyle is not God's will. And you have to say that to a family member. But it takes wisdom in how to, to say that. You just can't be beating people because those people who God loves just as much, he died for them just as he, he died for us. So it takes wisdom. But how do we get that wisdom? How do we tap into it? Same thing the pastor was talking about. We're going to have to shift, shift our mindset, shift from what church was into what God is doing. And it takes time to do that. I love what you said about the matter. The matter. It takes a. It's a daily process, and I think a lot of times we've we've kind of fallen into the old role that church churches have done in times past. If I can just make it from Sunday to Sunday, or Sunday to Wednesday, and you know you you kind of uh, compartmentalize God. I'm going to church, and then on Monday I'm with the, I'm doing whatever I want to do, and then I can switch it back on on Wednesday, and then on Thursday, I can switch it back off again. And that shift that you're talking about is so, is so intricate and so deep. We're going to have to do this every day. We become a move of God. I, and, 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 and go ahead and say what you said. Not beca- um, you said we'll become a move of God. Um, expound on that a little bit more. I heard, I heard a minister once say one time, I want to be a part of the move of God, you know, uh, talking about, you know, trying to motivate people to get involved in this kind of thing. Well, see, Here's, here's the thing. And like in your neighborhood, I want to be a part of the move of God in my neighborhood. Well, what if there's not a move of God in your neighborhood? You ever think maybe God sent you? It's your time to say, here am I, Lord. Here am I, Lord. S- send me. Use me. Give me, give me, what, I, g- give me what I need. Get, start, start your training process. Start your training technique. And become a move of God. But I mean, but that's that. But like you said, that's that's shifting. That's when we talk about shifting. That's what we're talking about, moving in that direction that he's talking about. And that takes time in the Word. It takes time. It takes time spending time with the Word. Um, I know we had some questions tonight, and that was a, a great question earlier today, um, because some people are facing that. If if I'm in ministry, I want to move with God, but but I have a partner that's not moving 
the way that God wants us to go, what do I do? This is, this is real life, people. <laughs> this, is, this is what we're facing. And so when it comes down to shifting, the shifting says, well, first there's God, and then there's ministry, and then, and then there's family. And the only reason, way I can win my family is that if I, that I'm faithful to God and faithful to the ministry that will supply me the grace that I need to win my family. So that's a great, that's a great question. Great question. So we're going to have to move. We're going to have to, it, it, and it takes a lot of, I guess what they say in, um, in, uh, in Jeremiah, it takes a lot of tearing down. So we got a lot, it's a lot of things that we don't know. And we need to be comfortable in saying we don't know in order for God to give us what we do know so that we can walk forward. Because I think, you know, old churches, and we've been a part of, uh, have done things the way they've done things in times past, and it has produced us this far. But, but, but I'm talking about church-wide, but we're, unaf- we're not effective. I remember when Linda was preaching about how she loved um, the Atlanta area and how um, the word was there, but then you go in the same area that the church is in and the neighborhoods are torn down. Nothing is being done. And that's what Pastor is talking about tonight. Nothing is being done. And instead of waiting for somebody to do something and we be a part of it, we have to look at ourselves and say, I'm going to start it. I'm going to start it in my own house. I'm going to start it in me. And then we're going to start it in here, and then we're going to move abroad. Uh, there was so much I had on forgiveness, man. You know, I mean, it was going to be so good. I was going to break down the scriptures. and <laughs> <laughs> Oh, well. But at the end of there, at the end of there, when see here's the, here's how you know when you're in unforgiveness. Uh, the, he goes, he moves through a lot of uh, un, uh, unforgiveness stuff, and then he goes down to the, and the, the the one that wouldn't forgive is delivered to the tormentors. And basically, what Jesus is saying, the greatest in the kingdom is the man that learns how to forgive, because the unforgiveness stops you more than anything. And if you're going to be great in the kingdom, you can't let that stuff in. It doesn't matter who does what to you. You got to shake it off. You got to let it go. Because if not, it's going to stop you. It stopped me for years. But then I, you know, I had to, I had to get up, I had to get, wake up and face myself, which wasn't easy. But, and I'm still having to do it. So, all right, are we done? Yeah, see. It's supposed to be. It's supposed to be more of a team effort. We got to get this. We got to get this team. Mickey's doing this right here. We got to get this team thing down a little bit better. Yeah, maybe if we get some. I don't know. We'll work. We'll work on it though. Did y'all get anything out of it tonight? I do appreciate you being here. I know it wasn't easy. I see her back there. She's got. She's all. It, that, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's tough to get warm when you get wet. You know. But I appreciate you being here during the middle of the week. I figure if you're going to get dressed up and come out and uh, put your makeup on and all that kind of stuff, we better have a word from God for you. So, Y'all have a good day. Good night and good week. <laughs>